Chapter 9 of The Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter 9 Reform of the City Watch, Fire Companies, Reverend Mr. Whitefield, Effects of His Preaching his project of building an orphan house in Georgia, anecdotes, Franklin's opinion of him, Franklin's prosperity, military defense of the province, formation of companies. Franklin now began to turn his attention to public affairs. One of his first efforts in this way was to reform the city watch. This was managed in the different wards by the constables, who assembled a certain number of housekeepers to attend them for the night. Those who did not choose to attend paid six shillings a year to be excused. This made the constableship an office of profit, for, instead of spending the money thus received in hiring other watchmen, it was spent in liquors, by which the constables were able to get a parcel of ragamuffins about them, instead of decent and orderly men. These fellows seldom went the rounds of the watch, but spent most of the night in tippling. In the course of a few years, by the exertion of Franklin and his friends, an entire alteration was produced in the law upon this subject, about the same time that he began to converse at the Junto on the abuses of the watch. He wrote a paper on the different accidents by which houses were set on fire, and by means proposed of avoiding them. This gave rise to a project, which soon followed, of forming a company to assist with readiness at fires. Thirty persons were immediately found, willing to join in the scheme. Their articles of agreement obliged every member to keep always in order and fit for use a certain number of leathern buckets, with strong bags and baskets for packing and carrying goods, which were to be brought at every fire. They also held a monthly meeting to converse upon the subject of fires and communicate such ideas as might be useful in their conduct on such occasions. This company proved so useful that another was soon formed and thus went on, one new company after another till they included most of the inhabitants who were men of property. The club first formed was called the Union Fire Company, and, we believe, still exists. These institutions have been exceedingly useful in extinguishing fires and preserving property. In 1739, the Reverend Mr. Whitefield arrived in Philadelphia from Ireland. This man had made himself very remarkable as a preacher, going about the country and discoursing, sometimes in churches, sometimes in the fields, to crowds of people, with great effect. He was at first permitted to preach in some of the churches in Philadelphia, but the clergy soon took a dislike to him and refused him their pulpits. This obliged him again to discourse in the streets and open fields. Large multitudes collected to hear his sermons. It was wonderful, says Franklin, to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were grown religious, so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. And it being found inconvenient to assemble in the open air, subject to its inclemencies, the building of a house to meet in was no sooner proposed, and persons appointed to receive contributions, but sufficient sums were soon received to procure the ground and erect the building, which was one hundred feet long and seventy broad, and the work was carried on with such spirit as to be finished in a much shorter time than could be expected. On leaving Philadelphia, Mr. Whitefield went preaching all the way through the colonies to Georgia. The settlement of that province had then been recently commenced and was made with peoples entirely unfit for such a service. They were unable to endure hardship, and perished in great numbers, leaving many helpless children, with nothing to feed or shelter them. The sight of their miserable situation, said Franklin, inspired the benevolent heart of Mr. Whitefield, with the idea of building an orphan house there, in which they might be supported and educated. Returning northward, he preached up this charity, and made large collections, for his eloquence had a wonderful power over the hearts and purses of his hearers, of which I myself was an instance. I did not disapprove of the design, but as Georgia was then destitute of materials and workmen, and it was proposed to send them from Philadelphia at a great expense, I thought it would have been better to have built the house at Philadelphia, and brought the children to it, 
This I advised, but he was resolute in his first project, rejected my counsel, and I, therefore, refused to contribute. I happened soon after to attend one of his sermons, in the course of which I perceived he intended to finish with a collection, and I silently resolved he should get nothing from me. I had in my pocket a handful of copper money, three or four silver dollars, and five pistols in gold. As he proceeded, I began to soften, and concluded to give the copper. Another stroke of his auditory made me ashamed of that, and determined me to give the silver. And he finished so admirably, that I emptied my pocket wholly into the collector's dish, gold and all. At this sermon there was also one of our club, who, being of my sentiment respecting the building in Georgia, and suspecting a collection might be intended, had, by precaution, emptied his pockets before he came from home. Towards the conclusion of the discourse, however, he felt a strong inclination to give, and applied to a neighbour who stood near him to lend him some money for the purpose. The request was fortunately made to perhaps the only man in the company who had the firmness not to be affected by the preacher. His answer was, At any other time, friend Hopkinson, I would lend to thee freely, but not now, for thee seems to me to be out of thy right senses. Some of Mr. Whitefield's enemies affected to suppose that he would apply these collections to his own private emolument. But I, who was intimately acquainted with him, being employed in printing his sermons, journals, etc., never had the least suspicion of his integrity, but am to this day decidedly of opinion that he was, in all his conduct, a perfectly honest man, and methinks my testimony in his favour ought to have the more weight, as we had no religious connection. Ours was a mere civil friendship, sincere on both sides, and lasted to his death. The last time I saw Mr. Whitefield was in London, when he consulted me about his orphan house concern, and his purpose of appropriating it to the establishment of a college. He had a loud and clear voice, and articulated his words so perfectly that he might be heard and understood at a great distance, especially as his auditories observed the most perfect silence. He preached one evening from the top of the courthouse steps, which are in the middle of Market Street and on the west side of 2nd Street, which crosses it at right angles. Both streets were filled with hearers to a considerable distance. Being among the hindmost in Market Street, I had the curiosity to learn how far he could be heard. By retiring backwards down the street towards the river, and I found his voice distinct till I came near Front Street, when some noise in that street obscured it. I computed that he might well be heard by more than 30,000. This reconciled me to the newspaper account of his having preached to 25,000 people in the fields, and to the history of General Harangan's whole armies, of which I had sometimes doubted. Franklin's business was now constantly increasing, and his newspaper had become very profitable. He began to feel the truth of the old proverb, that after getting the first hundred pounds, it is more easy to get the second. Those of his workmen who behaved well, he established in printing houses in different colonies, on easy terms. Most of them did well, and were able to repay him what he had advanced, and go on working for themselves. At this period there was no preparation for military defence in Pennsylvania. The inhabitants were mostly Quakers, and had neglected to take any suitable measures against the enemies to whom they might be exposed. There was also no college in the state, nor any proper provision for the complete education of youth. Franklin, accordingly, turned his attention to these very important subjects. Spain had been several years at war with Great Britain, and had now been recently joined by France. From the French possessions in Canada, Pennsylvania was exposed to continual danger. The governor of the province had been for some time trying to prevail upon the Quaker Assembly to pass a militia law, and take other necessary steps for their security. He tried, however, in vain. Franklin thought that something might be done by a subscription among the people. To promote this plan, he wrote and published a pamphlet called Plain Truth. In this, he stated their exposed and helpless situation, and represented the necessity of union for their defence. The pamphlets had a sudden and surprising effect. A meeting of citizens was appointed, and attended by a considerable number. Proposals of intended union had been printed, and distributed about the room to be signed by those who approved them. When the company was separated, the papers were collected and found to contain about 1,200 signatures. 
other copies were scattered about the country, and subscribers at length amounted to upwards of ten thousand. All these furnished themselves, as soon as they could, with arms, formed themselves into companies and regiments, chose their own officers, and met every week to be instructed in military exercises. The women made subscriptions among themselves and provided silk colours, which they presented to the companies, painted with different ornaments and mottoes, supplied by Franklin. The officers of the company that formed the Philadelphia Regiment chose Franklin for their colony. Not considering himself fit for the office, he declined, and recommended that Mr. Lawrence, a man of influence and of a fine person, should be chosen in his place. This gentleman was accordingly elected. Franklin now proposed a lottery to pay the expenses of building a battery below the town, and of furnishing it with cannon. The lottery was rapidly filled, and the battery soon erected. They brought some old cannon from Boston, and these not proving sufficient, they sent to London for more. The associates kept a nightly guard at the battery, and Franklin regularly took his turn of duty as a common soldier. His activities in these measures was agreeable to the governor and council, and secured their favour. They took him into their confidence, and consulted him on all operations in respect to the military. Franklin took the opportunity to propose a public fast to promote reformation, and implore the blessing of heaven on their undertaking. They embraced the motion, but as this was the first fast ever thought of in the province, there was no form for the proclamation. Franklin drew it up in the style of the New England Proclamation. It was translated into German, printed in both languages, circulated through the province. This gave the clergy of the different sects an opportunity of influencing their hearers to join the association, and it would probably have been generally among all but the Quakers, if it had not been for the news of peace. End chapter 9